Good morning, everybody. Good morning. And happy mm -hmm. Father's Day. It is good to be in God's house. And Olivia says happy Father's Day, too. And uh, so it's good to be in God's house, and uh, we're thankful for what God is doing. We're looking forward to a good time in the Lord. And uh, we're going to open this service the best way that I know how and with a word of prayer. And so if you've got uh, requests on your heart you'd like to make known by an upraised hand, We have several unspoken and some very urgent needs that we know of, and we want to just lift them all to the Lord. And we're thankful that there's a God that hears and answers our prayer. We serve a living God. Amen? Amen. Amen. So let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for this day. We thank you for how you have blessed us. We thank you for your love, your grace, your mercy. We thank you for just all the many things that you have done to bestow your kindness and love on us. If you never answered another prayer, you're still worthy of our praise. Lord, we pray today that you would be with each and every need, and you know there are some that are heavy on our hearts, and Lord, we pray that you would just undertake for each one. We pray, Lord, that you would be with this service today as we honor our fathers. We pray that you would help us to honor our Heavenly Father most of all. We thank you and we praise you for all that you are and all that you do. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. I will endure his days with thanksgiving in my heart. I will endure his days with him and honor him and today also is a special day so we're going to take time to honor our fathers and uh, I always say on Mother's Day that this part of the service is tough because you have to ask people their ages but Father's Day is not that bad so because most guys are, if you can turn that down just a little, Amanda, thank you. Um, most guys are proud they made it that far. So we're going to take a moment to honor our dads. And uh, it's a tradition here where we honor our three very special dads that are in our presence. And then we honor all our dads with a little gift and our love and appreciation for them. Um, we honor the, first of all, the oldest dad, the oldest dad, and I know one, one of them in the running might be outside there, um, so the oldest dad, I, let's see, uh, anybody 70, 70, 70, anybody 70? 75? Anybody older than 75? A dad. Nice try. Anybody older than 75? <laughs> Bill Wooten, congratulations. If one of our runners wants to run that to him, 
And uh, Cam, if you can come up and be ready for the next one, and then Taylor, if you'll come back. Uh, yeah, uh huh. You, you better give that to Brother Bill. He'll get to you. He'll get to you. All right. Now we're going to, the youngest dad, the youngest dad. Um, Corey, your stepdad, how old are you? 30? Jeremy? How old are you? Goes to Corey. Congratulations, Corey. Oh, well, are you, uh, then it goes to Charles. Remember, we are in church. We are in church, people. Let's not lie. In, don't lie at all, but especially not in church. All right. Um, and now for the one that has the most children with them. Um, and I think, I think somebody's already counted, so they already know. That goes, now that goes to Jeremy. So, All right. Congratulations to all of you. Thank you. Um, it is also a tradition, and I, I wasn't sure if we were going to be able to do this this year, but the Lord has really helped Sister Angie through her surgery. So we're going to have her come, and she's going to read a poem at this time. being real careful coming sideways through there. <laughs> Happy Father's Day to all the fathers that are here, the fathers that are out there, our fathers that have gone on to heaven. Um, and uh, this is a Helen Steiner Rice poem. She gets so much feeling into a few lines. Fathers are wonderful people. Fathers are wonderful people, too little understood, and we do not sing their praises as often as we should. For somehow, fathers seem to be the man who pays the bills, while mother binds up little hurts and nurses all our ills. And father struggles daily to live up to his image as protector and provider and hero of the scrimmage. And perhaps that's the reason that sometimes we get the notion that fathers are not subject to the thing we call emotion. But if you look inside Dad's heart, where no one else can see, you'll find he's sentimental and as soft as he can be. But he's so busy every day in the grueling race of life, he leaves the sentimental stuff to his partner, his wife. But fathers are just wonderful in a million different ways, and they merit loving compliments and accolades of praise. For the only reason dad aspires to fortune and success is to make the family proud of him and to bring them happiness. And like our heavenly father, he's a guardian and a guide someone we can count on to always be at our side. Thank you. At this time, we're going to take an opportunity to honor our dad. So if you are a father, grandfather, stepfather, we're going to ask you to come forward, and then I'm going to ask our young people if they will help us and I know we've got some young people up here on the stage. Sister Cora, she raised her hand. Um, so <laughs> they're going to help hand things out too. So um, all our dads, please come on. Don't be shy. And uh, we're going to have you all come up here, and we'll present you with a little gift. And uh, by the way, um, it is their day, ladies, so if they want to share those moon pies, that's up to them. Do not take them. Uh, there are some of you that did that last year, and it's just not fair. So,
Slide in a little bit. Slide in a little bit so we can get a picture. We give God all the praise, and uh, you know, when we look out on this congregation, there are so many miracles that we see, and we're just so thankful. Uh, today, you know, Sister Angie able to read that poem, just coming through major surgery, and then Brother Harvey walking up here without any assistance, and then able to stand and share, and that's a blessing. And it all goes back to what James says. All good, good and perfect things come from above, from the Father of lights. It is God that gives us all the good things and the blessings we can enjoy. And we're going to continue to lift him up and praise him.
marvelous, how wonderful is his love for me. say that I forgot about this song, but Brother Carl said, we're going to do that this year, right? I said, oh yeah, and uh, I always look forward to Father's Day to be able to do this recitation that reminds me of my dad, uh, but also it's one that ever since I heard it, I always wanted to do it, and uh, if you play instruments, I don't know if it's hard for everybody, but it's hard for me to play and talk. Um, I can play and sing, but it's hard to play and talk. So Brother Carl um, and I worked uh, on this, and uh, it's simply called Father's Table Grace. While we sat at our table, my family's heads bowed low. My thoughts returned to childhood, to the finest man I know. He doesn't speak good English, and he's just a simple man. But when he talks to the Lord, even a little child can understand. I was awful young and reckless, the thought still comes to me. When I told Dad, I felt that I was old enough to leave. He sat there at the table, 
this look on his face. But he never spoke another word till he said the table grace. He said, our gracious Heavenly Father, we all gathered here today to give thee things of blessing. So humbly we pray. My oldest son is leaving and I guess he knows what's best. But just in case, would you stand by and help him pass the test? And Lord, he's awful neglectful about church on Sunday morning. And if he gets with the wrong crowd, would you let him hold your arm? And if he flies too high, would you clip his wings? But don't let him fall too hard. I know you can handle things. Well, I've tried my best from day to day to teach him right from wrong. He's grown to be a fine young man, Lord, and he's always blessed our home. I just pray for understanding that he won't build upon the sand, but I won't worry half as much, Lord, if I know he's in your hands. Oh, and Lord, it won't be long till I'll be coming home. We'll have some long talks and walk together and please don't make me wait too long. We beg, dear Lord, for guidance and please protect us from sin so we all can meet in heaven in Jesus' name. Amen. The table was silent as tears went down my face and from that day on I based my life on Father's table grace. This this reminds me of my dad. He just he was premature, gray, and uh, ain't a day goes by I don't think about him. He died in 1988, and uh, he tried to make a fisherman out of me. I hated fishing, but Daddy loved it. And since he's passed, I ain't dipped a line. But I tell you what, when we get to heaven, <laughs> we'll be in the boat all the days long. Get the right key, Brian. <laughs> There's 
snow in his hair and I help put it there a halo of worry and care as my daddy grows old he's more precious than gold for a cheer As we honor and cherish our dads today and always if your dad is not with you today as mine has gone on to be with the Lord, we have wonderful memories, don't we? Um, and I know that Father's Day can be tough for many and for some maybe you didn't have the best example of a dad, but today we're going to exalt the perfect father. God the Father who gave His only Son for us. And the, the title today is Mimicking Dad. And um, I brought with me my dad's boots. And these are the very same boots that I remember sitting by the back of the back door of our house. Um, these were just one pair, but these were the pair that, for whatever reason, I always got a hold of and uh, put them on and would walk around trying to act like my dad, and I would usually grab his hat, and it was always a little big, and I would try to be like him uh, when I was probably about uh, eight, maybe earlier, maybe a little year or two later, my dad worked for uh, Rockingham Construction Company, and they were uh, linemen and construction workers, and dad was a lineman, and he would climb poles, and somebody uh, from his work, unbeknownst to he or my mama, got me a junior uh, from C&P Telephone, that dates it, uh, a junior telephone lineman get up. I had the belt, the hard hat, the little dull spikes that went in your shoes. They were just for play. But And I would walk around and pretend to be my dad and I would climb up on things. Now you can imagine having cerebral palsy and climbing up on things. My mom was a nervous wreck. But I would climb up on things and be fixing the telephone, and I wanted to be like Dad. I knew from an early age that I looked like him, but I wanted to be like him. What Daddy did, I wanted to do. When Dad was, when I was younger, I would be three steps behind him. If he was doing something, I was right there. In fact, mimicking him so much that I picked up a lot of his phrases and now doing youth ministry and dealing with young people so many years, you always say, well, I don't ever, I'll never say that. I've said every one of them. And I think of him. And many of you have heard some of these words of wisdom. They may not be exact, but my dad would always have these phrases and it gave me a love for fun phrases my grandmother did too and but he would say things like after he was snoring and you'd go to turn the TV off don't change the channel I was just resting my eyes I used to laugh when he would fall asleep in a chair because I thought man he can't even stay awake I've reached a stage in my life now where I fall asleep in a chair. I understand. I get it. How about, don't complain that you just have to walk to the end of the street to catch the bus. Because when I was your age, we had to walk five miles to school 
and it was uphill both ways. Son, who's paying the bills around here? Shut that refrigerator door. When you start driving, son, don't forget to check the oil. What? I don't know. Ask your mother. Or this one. Uh, yeah, we made a mess, didn't we? I know one thing. We better get this cleaned up before your mama gets home. Or if I did something really stupid, he'd put his hands on his hips, make that big sigh. Oh, I'd rather he beat me to death than give me the big sigh. And he'd go, swift, Brian, real swift. Sometimes, boy, if brains were dynamite, you wouldn't have enough to blow your nose. Or this one. If you don't settle down, I'm going to iron your clothes with you in them. All kinds of things like that. Or if you don't settle down, I'm going to put a knot in your tail. Or I'm going to put something on you that Ajax won't take off. Or I'm going to put a knot in you that them Boy Scouts can't untie. Dad was a scout leader. <laughs> so there were all kinds of things. One of my favorites was, this was fun, wasn't it? Yeah, Dad, it was. Let's not tell your mama. <laughs> that usually came when he let me do something that mama wouldn't let me do. Now, before you think he was letting me do bad stuff, I'm talking about let me mow the grass. Mom wouldn't even let me mow the grass. Boy, I thought I was high cotton mowing the grass. You did good, son. Thank you, Dad. Oh, with the push mower. That was like cardinal sin number 42 in Mom's book. You're going to cut your legs. If you're out there mowing with your daddy and you cut your legs off, don't come running to me. <laughs> Got it, Mom. Got it. How many of you heard this one? Would you all hush? The news is on. Yeah. Yeah, the new, and when the news was on, the world stopped in Daddy's world. Uh, do you think money grows on trees? And then if he sent us somewhere to buy something, we would always hear, I want all my change back. A lot of wisdom that I learned, but I always wanted to be like my dad. Now, I understand that not everybody had that experience. I understand that some people uh, didn't even have a dad in their life. But today, there's a challenge to the men in our audience, but also this challenge can go all across the board. Leading by example and fathers that are trying to mimic their heavenly father. One such father named Julius Caesar trying to decide whether to cross over into another town or not and he knew if he did this would change everything. Economically, politically it would change it all. He knew that if he made this decision, it would change the course of him and everybody that he was in contact with. As he looked across the Rubicon, he squeezed the sides of his horse and said, go. So much so that the phrase crossing the Rubicon now refers to, in colloquial English, as a decision that will change the course of our life. As men, as fathers, all of us have the cross the Rubicon moment. The Bible tells us 
In Ephesians 6, 4, Fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord. But we all must make a decision as men. And again, I am talking primarily to the men today. It is Father's Day. But all of this can apply to any person. Do not provoke your children to wrath. Another translation says, do not intentionally upset them. Don't keep agitating them. I remember a friend of mine asking me one time, because he had some uh, relatives that were really, really um, legalistic in some of their beliefs, and they uh, got on him because he would, uh, you know how men do, and they... He would tease his son. And they said, now you shouldn't do that because you're provoking your children to wrath. And he was all upset about that because he was like, well, I don't do anything mean to them. I'm not trying to tease them bad. I'm just, we're just having fun. And I assured him that if it was just in fun and, and you weren't doing it, the scripture didn't mean don't, don't tease or relate with them. It means don't intentionally aggravate them to the point that they get so mad and keep them in a state of agitation. You're supposed to train them in the fear and the admonition of the Lord. So when we see that, that's a high calling. That's a high calling. Now, that's the easy part. We're going to get deeper. And I already know that those of you that are not men people, you, you already given side eyes and pointing. Please do not do that for the rest of the message. Please come with the, to this message with a rake and not a shovel. Oh, this is... This, I can apply this to me even though he's talking about daddies. Not, oh, I hope my husband's listening to this. I hope my kids are paying attention. No. Rake it in, okay? But how do we do that? How do we get there, men? How do we get there? Joshua tells us in the Old Testament, in Joshua 24, and that's where we're going to be today, just two verses. So if you listen fast, I'll talk fast. Now therefore fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in truth and put away the gods which your fathers served on the other side of the flood and in Egypt and serve ye the Lord. And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom you will serve, whether the gods on your fathers served that were on the other side of the flood or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me... And my house, we will serve the Lord. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. So that we can raise our children in the way that God wants us to, we first have to make a personal decision. As for me. Men, have you decided as for me? As for me. I will serve the Lord. There's a couple things in that statement. First of all, you must make Him the Lord of your life. They talked about other gods. Well, that's little g gods. We have other gods we worship in this country. You know that, right? Have we put our job ahead of God? Have we put our family ahead of God? Have we put entertainment ahead of God. Have we put, I'm going to turn around so nobody feels convicted by me. Have you put sports and your child's sports and activities ahead of God? Have you, you, the head of the house, men, have you decided you're going to serve the Lord and make Him the Lord, capital L, of your life? 
And also, are you going to serve him? If you've ever worked in a restaurant or you've ever had an opportunity to serve, that's hard work, right? They used to say when in the, in the old days when you go to a restaurant, somebody say, how may I serve you today? But that is where we're at if God is the Lord of our life and Jesus is our Savior and he just didn't, we just don't believe he, he died to just keep us out of hell. He, he not only died to keep us out of hell, he, he died to keep the hell out of us. That's true. I'm going to say that again. Because sometimes I say stuff and I'm like, I need to write that down later. But he didn't just die to keep us out of hell. He died to keep the hell out of us. So that we can serve him and honor him and when we do that, then we will not be provoking our children to wrath, but we will be raising them in the admonition of the Lord so that they will learn when they're mimicking us because they're watching. And you may say, well, I don't have any children. I live by myself or I live with, with the, my siblings and nobody's watching me. Yes, they are. Yes, they are. I remember in school... Uh, for Halloween, you know, we all would dress up for Halloween parties and stuff, and we had some janitors in our school that everybody just loved them. Liz, Curtis, Ray, and uh, we called them Mr. Ray, Miss Liz, and Mr. Curtis. Or most kids couldn't remember Mr. Curtis's name. And Mr. Curtis, by his own admission, had lived a hard life. And he used to say that, well, he just looked kind of rough. And so they would call him Ray 2 or Mr. Ray number 2. But one year, some kids decided that they were going to dress up as the janitorial staff for Halloween. And the principal thought it was a fun thing to do. So he let them shadow him for the day. Well, I didn't get in on that, but I saw it. I didn't dress like the janitors. I dressed like Ernest P. Worrell. <laughs> but if you know, you know. If you don't, you don't know what I mean. But anyhow, so... They, they shadowed them and they mimicked them and even during the break when they would sit down at the lunch tables, they would sit down at times and, and have their coffee. The kids would sit and drink coffee and they mimicked them. It was so cool. It wasn't making fun of them, they mimicked them. And it was so cool. And you know, those guys didn't know that those kids were watching them. In fact, I'll never forget it, at the end of the day, we had an assembly, and they honored those janitors for their hard work. And I'm telling you, you see old tough Curtis, he tough as a pine knot. Here, I appreciate it. See, I don't think he knew that people were watching him. They're watching. As for me, not for the preacher, as for me, I will serve, I will honor, I will do what the Lord wants me to do. I will live my life mimicking Him. Again, I remember when our school first got a fax machine. I'd never seen one before. That's old technology now, right? But I remember helping in the office one day and they had to boot that thing up. It'd take 10 years and they said it's going to send a duplicate across the phone lines and then somebody in another state can pick that up and it's going to be, was it the original? No, it was a duplicate. It was a copy that had been faxed over. Well, what happened? The phone lines transferred the data 
and then it came in the form of another copy. Well, when we get saved and He's the Lord of our life, the Holy Spirit comes in and transfers the power and the Spirit of God to us to where we are conformed to the image of God. We are not God, but we have the characteristics of Him and we become a copy of heaven. Amen? That's what it means to let the Lord be the Lord of your life. Well, I'm not perfect, Brother Brian, and I'm at... Neither am I. Right? But when we make Him Lord of our life, then He continues to work on us. So it's a personal decision. But then He says, and my house. So it's a parental decision. Now I just got to tell you that right now, probably for the rest of this message, I'm going from preaching to meddling, so just hang on. I've just about had it. Well, I have had it a long time ago. And nobody in here but people we all know of parents that allowed the children to be in control. Oh, yeah, y'all got real quiet. It's okay. Because um, some, some of them is your children raising your grandbabies and you don't want to say nothing. I understand. But when we have quit being parents and the kids get to make all the decisions. Mm -mm. I see some of that today and the Lord really has to help me show grace. Because I, 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 it, uh, it just does something to me. I just, I just want to just say, like, what is wrong with you? You're the parent. Don't let them decide. I wish I would have got up on Sunday morning and said, I'm not going to church today. Are you sick? No. I just don't want to go. Well, if I'd have done that one time, children, I wouldn't have had to go to church. No. Because the next time I'd have been in church would have been in my little casket because my daddy would have killed me. It wasn't an option. You was going to church. Because my dad and my mom made a decision as for me and my house. My mom and dad decided a long time ago it didn't matter what the White House said. They weren't raising dogs in their house. They were raising children in the very image of God and they were going to take them to church and train them in the right way. Now, does that mean they do everything right? No. Does that mean that they'll stick with it till the end of their life? No. But as for you and your house, you're going to serve the Lord. Well, you don't understand. You know, we, we have a situation where, you know, I don't have them all the time. So, so you know, when they go, go away and then they come back, I have to retrain them. Good, you said the right thing. Retrain them. And keep retraining them. Oh, well, we don't want to shove religion down their throat. If this wasn't my daddy's boots, I'd throw them right now. I got news for you. The devil is shoving all his stuff down their throat every day, all day, and you pat them on the head and send them with a smile. Told you. There's a church in North Carolina, and I love what they've done. I, 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 I didn't feel called to do it, so we're not going to. But you know, we all know that June is Pride Month. Well, they decided they took, because I don't know if you know this, but the Pride Rainbow and the, the God Rainbow, the Pride Rainbow is missing colors. And they took the biblical rainbow that you see in the sky, they made a flag out of it, and they are celebrating Jesus Pride Month. And there's people in his church that says, don't you think you're taking this a little too far? He said, no. And he began to list all of the days that are honoring that lifestyle. Did you know there's almost one for every month of the year? He said, so I don't think we're shoving anything down anybody's throat. Oh, preacher, but, 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 no. 
I understand life is hard. I understand people are different. I understand raising kids today is not easy because they have been exposed to way more than I ever had to be exposed to, and you too. And those of you that are, have a little more age on you than I do, you can definitely say amen. But as for me and my house, it's a parental decision. And again, meddling, but it's all right. I love you, and that's why I do it. If we love the Lord and we follow his principles, and you can send me angry emails if you want to, the man is the head of the house. I know, I know. But that's what the Bible says, right? Now, I know I've heard it all. He's the head, but I'm the neck. Yeah, okay. We'll deal with that in another day. But uh, they need to, that woman needs to get sanctified. But anyhow, <laughs> the man is the head of the house. Now, that does not mean that it's a subservient thing where the woman is just a doormat and she doesn't do anything and she's told and she jumps. He says jump, she says how high, no. Because when you look at what God designed as a marriage and as a male-female relationship, one man, one woman together for life, it says, husbands, love your wife as Christ loved the church. When you love your wife as Christ loved the church, what did Christ do for the church? He died for it. When we make the decision that we're going to serve the Lord, that's sacrificial. We're going to put our needs, our desires aside. And then when we say to our kids, hey, it's time to go to church. It's time to do this. We're not cramming it down our throat. We're modeling it. We're mimicking the Father. Right? Okay. Quiet again. It's okay. I didn't say it was e easy, but it's true, right? And then one thing that you don't necessarily see in the text, but if you were to read the whole chapter, when it opens up in Joshua 1 and 2, it says that Joshua addresses the entire congregation or all the people. So this is not just a personal decision. It's not just a parental decision. It is a public decision. There are going to be times when you have to say, if you're going to raise your children in the fear and the admonition of the Lord, there are going to be activities that you're going to have to say, no, my kids ain't doing that. Sorry. We just can't do that. And that's where we really show where our loyalties lie. Now, that's between you and the Lord, not between me and you. Because everybody parents a little differently, right? So I can sit up here and, 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 or stand up here and give you some of my personal convictions that God convicted me of. They're biblical principle, but they're not overarching. Does that make sense? So he may convict you a little differently, and that's okay. As long as you're following the overarching principle that God is in control of your life and the way that you live your life points to him and not to everything else it's really kind of simple when you think about it because when we make a personal decision and a parental decision it has to become public right I will never forget it as long as I live My dad wanted me to wrestle, and that was not in Mama's plan or the doctor. The doctor said he better not. He didn't say he couldn't, just said better not. And I, to this day, I just like to tell that doctor he should never said that. But anyway, so I couldn't wrestle, so I became the manager of the wrestling team in eighth grade, and that was cool and that was fun. But you know, Mom was like, I don't know about him going all you know all these trips and stuff. And my dad was like, it's good for him, honey. And what dad knew that she didn't know was that I was learning all the wrestling moves and I could defend myself, and dad was proud of that, and so was I. So later on, they decided to start a drama club, and mom thought that's harmless. 
So I got to be in the drama club, and I remember my daddy telling me that I needed to tell Miss Mary Spody when I signed up for this drama club that I would be in it, but it could not take me out of Wednesday night church. They didn't do nothing on Sundays back then, so that wasn't an issue. And I couldn't do anything on the stage that I wouldn't do in front of my mama, and that included saying cuss words in a play and all manner of things, and just I had to stand up, and, and I didn't even know what I was getting into. But see, did you know that that example set the stage for my drama director? Because every time she picked a play, she made sure that it was, had, it was good for Freddie Bridges and Donna and made sure that it wasn't anything that I wouldn't do. Hey, now there were other high schools that were doing cutting edge things for the time. I remember when Osborne Park High School did a play and it had one cuss word in it. Oh, you'd have thought the whole world ended. And my dad, you know, <clears throat> see that? That's for you better not be doing them plays, you hear me? Don't even practice with stuff like that. Yes, sir, aye, aye, Captain. What Mama didn't know, and here's the fun part, was they taught me pratfalls and stuff, and we got hurt. We missed the mat every now and then. And it was fun. We had a good time. And I know that I won't tell this story today, uh, because frankly, I don't have the energy to tell it. But I remember the scene that I had to die. And I was really going to pour it on. And it was a comedy, so I had to die funny. So I'm bad, man, I'm doing it all. I'm grabbing my chest. I'm spinning around. I'm pulling a Fred Sanford. This is the big one. I'm coming to join you. I'm, I, man, I am just turning, spinning, telling my mom I love her. I mean, I'm doing the whole business. And finally, I lay down, and the lady that is, has the other part, she's waiting to say her line. She looks down at me, and she said, Would you hurry up and die already? Because I got stuff I got to do. <laughs> well, you know what? God is in his heaven looking down at the men that are supposed to be men of God and saying, Would you hurry up and die to me already? because I got stuff I want to do in you and in your household and in this world because when the men of God rise up and be who God has called them to be, then all the forces of hell cannot stand against them because then the church will be the church when the men are the men. And we live in a crisis of masculinity today. And when God's people start teaching God's word about what God means when a man is a man and makes a decision for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. You can do that. We're going to serve Jesus. I will never forget it. Watching my dad make stands in his life. And saying, we, we're not going to do this. But dad, so-and-so does it. Am I so-and-so's father? Yeah. I remember one time, and I don't remember the issue. I just remember that we didn't have cable, and my cousin had cable. And, and we would go, oh, I would go spend the night. And, and uh, my dad would always tell me, don't be watching nothing you ain't supposed to watch. Well, how do I know if I'm not supposed to watch it or not, Daddy? If I ain't never seen it? He said, you will know. And I did. And I remember coming home one day, and I said, Dad, we watched this on TV, and it was pretty good. What'd you watch? And I told him. He said, now, you know your mama's not going to allow you to watch that. And what channels would come on? And I told him, he said, well, good, we don't have that anyway. But, Dad, we, I want to get cable. He said, you can get, we can get cable when you get a job and pay for it. He said, but, but, Ma, but, but, but Dad, my Aunt Shirley has it, Uncle Glenn has it. I don't care. 
if you like it so much. In fact, come with me. Went to my room. He opened my closet, started pulling clothes out. I said, get your bag out. I said, what are you doing? He said, well, if you like it so much, you can go live with them. Well, I don't want to go live with them. You mean forever? Yeah. Well, they won't want me to live with them forever. Well, my house, my rules. And you know, I just thought that was so hard. We couldn't even lock our doors to our bedrooms. Didn't have a TV in my bedroom. All my friends had TVs in their bedrooms. And I thought, well, man, I must just be deprived because I ain't got a TV in my bedroom and I don't have what all the other kids had. And, you know, I'd be watching them little commercials come on the free TV where they play that sad music and the guy that looked like Adam from Bonanza would come on the screen and say, for 70 cents a day, you can support one of these children. And I'd be like, man. I know they got it rough. I do, too. I ain't got no TV in my room. I just, you know, and it felt all deprived and sad. And how stupid is that? And I'd be all sad. And then I realized something. Most of my friends that had all that stuff, their daddies didn't do nothing with them. They'd be like, what'd you do for the weekend, Bridget? Oh, me and my dad, we went... Well, he took me hunting. Oh, really? Yeah. Or, now you're going to laugh at this, but it's okay. It was fun for me. Me and my dad, we, we, we spent all Saturday going around getting stuff for the house. And we, we went to Sears. Now, I don't know about you, but when I grew up, you dressed up to go to Sears. <laughs> I mean, it was a big event because you didn't get to go. And, and it was a privilege to, for me to go with my dad because he worked so hard. And for him to go out on the weekend to do other things, that was a big deal. And I always knew that when I run errands with him, if I behaved myself, and I always did, that when it was over, we'd always get a treat. And we didn't tell mama. And what I wouldn't give for one more day of that. You see, because what mom and dad knew were important, it wasn't all the gadgets and the stuff. It was them teaching us. You may be sitting here today and say, well, I didn't have that Norman Rockwell childhood that you're describing. Well, it wasn't easy. It wasn't perfect. And maybe yours wasn't. And you don't know, when I share these things today, it doesn't resonate with you. But I will say this. I will echo the words that the Lord told me the night that I got angry at God when my dad passed away. I said, God, why'd you take him? He's gone. I need him. And just like I'm talking to you, he said, your daddy may be gone, but your heavenly father's not. I'll never forget that. And so today, no matter what Father's Day brings for you, what memories, whatever it holds, your daddy may be gone. Your daddy may have never been there, but your heavenly father has never left. And when we decide to make a personal decision that he's the Lord of our life, he will never leave us nor forsake us. And then it becomes a parental decision or a decision that spills out for those around us that we have charge over. And then it becomes a public decision. This Father's Day, no matter where you are, I pray that you would seek the God of heaven and earth. Make a personal decision to let him in, forgive you of your sin, and to serve him and make him the Lord, the judge, the controller, the final say over your life. And then as you do that daily, it will become a parental decision and a public one.
If you're watching online today, no matter what God has said to you, I pray that you would just reach out to your Heavenly Father, for He has never left you. He is always there. Doesn't matter what you've done or how far you've gone, He will always hear a prayer of repentance, and He will take you back and be the Father you need Him to be. May God bless you.